everybody, and welcome back to the vlog. Hey everybody, this one's gonna be a good one. I'm taking a break from Roy, but don't worry, we got plenty of Roy stories. Now we're gonna be doing a story about Vincent the Chin Giganti. And uh, this is an unbelievable story. Uh, and if I didn't have video, I probably wouldn't even do it because some of my stories are just so unbelievable. Some of you guys out there, I don't just don't believe it because you, you guys got to get to know me a little bit better. Once you get to know me, you'll be going, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. And that makes sense. So, okay, this is 1997. My book came out in 1996. And during that period of time, I must have did 50 uh, television interviews about my being the only confidential informant that's ever come forward, that ever wrote a book and put a picture on the cover of the book, just did all of these things, you know? So um, in 1997, during Vincent the Chin Giganti's triple murder um, court proceeding, proceeding, proceedings in U.S. District Court in the Southern District of New York. He was on trial for three murders. Prior to that, Vincent Nachinji Canty played the role of a doddering old man. He would put on his pajamas and we'd walk around the streets in the village, singing to parking meters and acting crazy. Why would Vincent Nachinji Canty do that? Well, the FBI set up surveillance in his neighborhood. They rented an apartment across the street and the landlord happened to be Goombas with Vincent the Chin Giganti and told him that they were set up over there and they were filming every time he walked in and out of his house. Not only that, now all you people from New York City, you know about parking meters, right? Parking meters are about 20, 20 feet apart from each other where you can park a car. The FBI put microphones in every single one of those parking meters on that block. So as Vincent the Chin Giganti took a walk, they were not only videotaping him, they were also audio taping him as he sang to these parking meters. So this is what happened. I never met Vincent the Chin Giganti. Never met him, never was had any dealings with his crime family? Never, never, never. So, it's 1997, as I said, he's on trial. His attorneys filed motion with the court uh, seeking dismissal on the ground that this is nothing, he's nothing more than a doddering old man. He doesn't know what time of day it is and he's insane. He's insane. Good, so that Motion was pending the very day, day and date, CBS, from CBS. It was a big show back then. It was like a Dateline show, but it was CBS instead of NBC. They called me and they asked me, would you go, would you go on? We want to talk to you about the mafia and your role as a FBI informant in the mafia. I said, sure. I didn't know it was G G Vincent the Jinky Dante. And for all you people that, that, that know about sound bites, you do an interview and then the media or the whoever takes out little pieces and they can make you say anything. And that's exactly what they did. So we're gonna play a clip and then I'm gonna play the whole interview uh, with me and two other uh, guys that were mafia reporters in New York City at the time. Both of them are, are um, uh, uh, they authored books about the mafia and at the time uh, Vincent the Ginger Canty was being represented by Barry Slotnick. Now, if you, that's a big name. He, he did a bunch of cases. He, anyway, just Google him, Barry Slotnick. And he, he's in this interview too. Now, there's four of us in this interview, uh, but we're not in the same studio. Where they, they actually came to my house. They, they, they sent the film crew to my house and he did the same thing with these other people. 
including Barry Slotnick. So, what I know about Vincent the Chin Giganti all came from the media. I didn't ever knew this guy. I, I never did, did anything. This is so funny. So, at the end of the video, they take a snippet, and I say something to this effect. You're going to see it. It's going to be right now. Um, he's like, I, I said, I said to, the, um, to the interviewer, I said, this guy's like an actor walking on stage. If he knows the FBI's up there filming him, he's going to give him something to film that's going to behoove him, right? So I, they, they cut that part of this. said, yeah, he's like an actor walking on stage. If he knows that, the, that he's faking, basically, I said it. You'll, you'll, you're going to see the video. And as soon as I said that, then the, the uh, announcer comes in, and a federal judge agrees. Whoa! Ah, put the brakes on. I never told no federal judge he was full of shit. But guess what? Not one, not two, not three mafia people from that uh, mob, mob family, I don't know if it was the Colombo, I forget which one it is, all were watching the news because he's on trial, but Vincent the Chin is out on bail. So they're all... They're all going, wait a minute, who's this? Oh, and they, and they identified me as a 20-year mob informant. That's how, they, that's how you'll see the, the, the logo underneath the, the interview. So they take it out and they go, well, let me tell you, let, let's, let's show you. Here's the clip right now. Boom. It's like an actor walking on stage. Kevin Marr was an undercover mob informant for 20 years. He says Gigante's a master con man that when he gets arrested, he pulls out that card and he's gonna play the insanity card. And the judge agreed. You see? You see what they did? Let's, let's hear it again. Let's hear that snippet again. It's like an actor walking on stage. Kevin Marr was an undercover mob informant for 20 years. He says Gigante's a master con man. That when he gets arrested, he pulls out that card and he's gonna play the insanity card. And the judge agreed. Now, just one more time. Let's hear it again. And oh, and by the way, to all you ladies, wasn't I one hell of a good-looking guy back in the days? <laughs> I had to. Anyway, boom. Con man. That when he gets arrested, he pulls out that card and he's going to play the insanity card. And the judge agreed. Okay. Now, after this video's done, I'm going to put the entire um, uh, interview up with everybody in it, so you can get an idea of what was going on. So the mob guys hear that, and they think, and why wouldn't they think, that I told that federal judge that he was full of crap, there was nothing wrong with him. So I get a call from 312 area code, which is Chicago, Illinois. And the guy identifies himself to me as an FBI agent. And he said, we have good information that Vincent and the Chin Giganti put a hit on you. And they're panicking right now and they want to do it now. And I go, what? And he says, yeah, not only us, NYPD and the New Jersey State Police. So he was vague and ambiguous. And he said, we found out where you live. You got to move and you got to do it now. So I don't want to get into the details about how the FBI, how they did this. I'm, I'm, not, going to, I'm not going to get into that. But the next thing you know, I, I had to move. I had to, I had to move that day. That night I, had to, I had to go to a hotel, got, a, got an apartment. It was so funny because I, I, I could tell you where it was now. So I, I lived in Carlstadt, New Jersey at the time. And um, I moved to Rutherford, New Jersey. Because I had uh, my friend Henry Walker at the time was a captain police. Department. I had a lot. Of, I had I, every all, all my cop friends were, were there, so I wound up going there. Uh, so um, this was an unbelievable story, and so I didn't wind up getting whacked. Uh, and um, I mean, it's just incredible how the media. And when you listen, let's let's listen to it one more time. This soundbite that when he gets arrested, he pulls out that card and he's going to play the insanity card. And the judge agreed. See? Doesn't it sound like I told the federal judge 
cut in. Those, those news people almost got me killed. This is the second time. The Daily News, they reported that I was a confidential informant on, on the Joe Rifkin. They, they, they'll, they'll get you killed, the media. What did I know back then? Did I mention I was one good-looking guy? Can you see that one more time? One more time. That when he gets arrested, he pulls out that card and he's going to play the insanity card. And the judge agreed. Yep. That's what happened. So anyway, I thought I'd give you guys a break from the Roy DeMeo, Roy DeMeo, Roy DeMeo, Roy DeMeo. And we throw in a little other mafia guys who's, I never even met these guys. And there was three of them that put a hit out on me. So anyway, thanks for tuning in. And as usual, I'll see you on the next one. Vincent Gigante, really incompetent or just playing a pajama game? Today, the man known for sporting his sleepwear on the streets is going for another round of psychiatric evaluation. In his bathrobe and slippers, Vincent the Chin Gigante looks more like a grandfather than a godfather. What have I ever done to make you treat me so disrespectfully? Dapper Don Gotti, he's not. In fact, to hear friends tell it, Gigante's just a doddering old man who hears voices in his head and forgets where he is. Vincent Gigante is not the boss of any crime family, but unfortunately, presently today, sits home with his mother and is quite incompetent. But yesterday, a federal judge ruled the man in the blue pajamas ran this country's most powerful crime family for more than two decades. It's like an act of walking on stage. Kevin Marr was an undercover mob informant for 20 years. He says Gigante's a master con man. That when he gets arrested, he pulls out that card and he's going to play the insanity card. And the judge agreed. Vincent Gigante is crazy like a fox, a ruthless mob boss who faked insanity to stay out of jail. He figures that if the government's going to film him, he'll give them something uh, to film. This, uh dilapidated looking black coated uh, storefront right behind me is has been the headquarters of Vincent Chin Gigante one of the major mob bosses in New York and it's been his headquarters for about 20 to 30 years Selwyn Rab covers the mob for the New York Times he says Gigante's not just sane he's dangerous and anyone who's opposed him uh, he has a reputation of being one of the most ruthless gang bosses in New York Gigante grew up on the mean streets of New York's Little Italy. He was an amateur boxer with a glass chin. That's how he got his nickname. When cops put gangster fat Tony Salerno away, Gigante reportedly took his place as head of the vicious Genovese crime family. So there is a double life to him. He doesn't spend it all the time in a pajama and a bathrobe. So what's next for the odd father? More psychiatrists. The judge has ordered four different doctors to examine the chin and decide if he's ready to stand trial on eight counts of murder. He's got years invested in wearing this coat and walking around, singing to parking meters and doing the thing he, he does. And so he believes it's going to work. All four doctors said they might change their minds about Gigante's mental state if presented with clear and convincing evidence that he actively ran mob operations or had planned in advance to fake an illness.